thanks for coming. So the topic we're going to be covering is how we take smart contracts and make them useful for real world, real world events. The approach we have to that is that for a smart contract to be a form of digital agreement that's useful for real world events, it needs to know about those real world events. It needs to about market price, know about market price changes, needs to about know about IoT data for insurance, it needs to know about GPS location for trade finance, it needs to reliably receive these inputs in order to be a form of digital agreement that meaningfully reacts to real world events. And then it also needs to be able to pay and settle in formats that users want to receive. So the, the fundamental problem that, that we would need to solve in order to get smart contracts from just doing tokens to being used as a form of digital agreement that is relied upon for all kinds of agreements, everything from insurance to securities to you know, a whole bunch of other interesting forms of digital agreement is to basically solve the smart contract connectivity problem. That problem is kind of very simple. It's just that smart contracts cannot talk to these events. So smart contracts live within their own network. They function within their own network and they only have data that's in that network already. So the only data they really have access to on their own is token movements. Without, uh, without having to access to any external data about market prices, events, IoT events data, GPS data for shipping, or, or, or any other category of data you can think of that relates to a contract, they can't react to it. So basically, we need to find a way to bridge that data into the contract. And we need to do that in a way that the contract remains reliable. Because if we bridge the data into the contract and it becomes unreliable, it's no longer a superior form of digital agreement. So this is the, the problem that our, our team and our company is solving. It's the problem of blockchain, uh, basically blockchain middleware. Providing that data to a smart contract while maintaining the security of a smart contract set up end to end, right? So what blockchain middleware like Chainlink does is it provides access to critical external data. It allows smart contracts to affect other systems off chain, whether those are internal systems or whether those are third-party payment systems, institutional or retail, and blockchain middleware also can be used to have contracts on one chain like Ethereum talk to other contracts and other chains like Hyperledger or you know, any other variant of chains. So basically the goal of blockchain middleware is the, the glue that allows us to create fair and useful smart contracts. That's, that's pretty much the focus of what, uh, what we're seeking to attain. Now, the important point to, to remember when you're thinking about a smart contract end to end, when you're not just considering, okay, here's the middle piece of the contract and it's running on 20,000 nodes and it's very reliable in my opinion, the, the thing to really consider is what is the end to end setup of the contract, right? You, you, you really, really care about the end to end reliability. How is this highly secure thing in the middle being triggered? How is it actually delivering payment? Why would I rely on this form of digital agreement from end to end, right? This is where the security of blockchain middleware basically becomes paramount. If the thing triggering your highly secure contract is insecure, your end-to-end -end setup is insecure. Also, the model of smart contracts is that it's a highly deterministic model compared to traditional digital agreements. So traditional digital agreements have tons of fallback systems. So they have, you know, you know, delays and they have reversals and they have all these things that allow people to fix problems. Smart contracts are much more deterministic in the sense that they're, they're, one of their greatest benefits is that they will execute as written in a deterministic, highly predictable, reliable way. So if you now are in a, in a, in a universe where you have deterministic digital agreements, you better be sure that the thing triggering your highly deterministic, very difficult to reverse, digital agreement is also reliable. So that the triggering mechanism in this type of universe of digital agreements is even, is even more important than, than, than elsewhere. So to solve this problem, you basically look at the security and reliability properties of a blockchain middleware like Chainlink. And you start to think about how can we make the triggering event for a highly deterministic form of digital agreement like a smart contract reliable? What are the properties that we want the trigger for our smart contracts to have? Now, we have, you know, um, we have a defense in depth approach where we uh, apply multiple uh, kind of security strategies at the same time. 
and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the ideas behind how you would make a reliable, secure oracle mechanism using decentralization and trusted execution environments. So from the perspective of decentralization and making sure that the, the trigger you're using for your contract is reliable, the thing you, you, you don't want to do is you don't want to have um, you, you don't want to have a setup where you have a data provider that's been around for 40 years and is probably relatively secure. You have the contract code being executed in an environment which is considered secure because there's thousands of nodes redundantly performing the same operation, which is the basis of the security of that computation. And then what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a single node that triggers that highly secure network. If you have a single node, Right, the, the basis of the security of the smart contract is that it's run redundantly on many nodes. Today, to, like, to an extreme degree, to an extreme degree of decentralization as a premium good. What, what, what you don't want to do is you don't want everything lopsided where you have an extreme amount of security on the contract state, but you have an extreme amount of insecurity on the trigger that actually does something to that contract state. Uh, because realistically, I can tell you quite simply, if you make an external, what we call an externally connected contract, this is going to be the attack vector. They're, they're just going to knock out the thing that gives the data to your contract, and your contract can be written very securely, can be run in a secure network, but it won't get the input and it won't function. So the approach to this is the same approach that people used for making smart contracts secure. It's basically a level of decentralization for this part of, it, of the smart contract lifecycle. Basically, you would have multiple nodes that are responsible for guaranteeing the reliability of an input. And then within our system, you can buy however many nodes that you want to guarantee that input. So we allow you to variably choose, I feel that I need decentralization of three nodes, or five nodes, or 10 nodes, or 15, or 20, or 50 nodes, to be comfortable that my input is reliable. Now, this is, is, is one of other approaches, but this is, I think, a meaningful approach because it provides similar guarantees to why we think a smart contract is reliable, while in our case giving people the ability to choose how much decentralization they actually want to pay for. In many cases today, people are overpaying for like thousands of nodes of decentralization where they might not necessarily need them, whereas in, in this scenario, I mean, the really one of the interesting problems we're tackling is once you define for people what a secure amount of decentralization is, how do people decide and, and choose and buy, you know, I want five nodes worth of decentralization or 10 nodes or 50 nodes for this specific operation in my contract's lifecycle. Now, once you have decentralized the, the essentially the blockchain middleware layer, then you can decentralize the data layer. Then you can say, I want multiple data providers, or I want one data provider, or I want, you know, five nodes going to one data provider, five nodes going to another data provider. But until you decentralize the, the delivery mechanism for those inputs and make it reliable, you, you can't really decentralize um, any, any side of the inputs. Now, what I think we should do very quickly is we should just walk through an example to, to put this a bit more in context. So let's say we have a contract where we're paying for delivery of you know, some type of good, whether from a supplier or retail, it, you know, some, some, some good that, that we want to pay out automatically because the supplier wants to be paid automatically and we want to pay them based on successful delivery and we have metrics we can track. So in this scenario, you would use chain links that pull from something like EasyPost or Flight Stats. Both of those data feeds can separately verify that the package is at a certain place or that the, the method of transporting the package has arrived and your contract can now be written around these external events using chain links that, represent, that provide this data to the contract. Then once the, the goods are delivered, you're going to need to pay. Commonly when people need to pay, they need to do a price calculation. If you're paying in crypto, you would need to do a crypto price calculation. Your contract would not even know what the, you know, what the prices of Ether or anything else was. So you now need a reliable mechanism to tell your contract, okay, it's Tuesday at 5.52 p.m. What is the um, actual amount I should pay relative to the market prices? And at this point, at that point, you would basically, you know, to, to assure the reliability of the input, get multiple inputs about that, either from one data source, multiple data source, 
and that would give you the assurance that both the package has arrived and that you're paying for it using the correct amounts. And if somebody wanted to you know, knock on your externally, now externally connected contract, they would have to knock out more and more systems. Just like if somebody wants to mess with the contract state, they have to knock out a massive amount of systems. Right? It's essentially the same security model applied to the blockchain middleware layer in order to create externally connected contracts. Then the next thing that blockchain middleware is quite good at is making sure that contracts are able to talk to useful systems. So if, it's, if this is uh, a, a large shipment, you're probably gonna use institutional banking systems and you're gonna pay out using a traditional banking system to the, whoever the suppliers are in one or multiple countries. That means you're gonna have to send you know, swift payment messages, you're gonna have to send any, any number of different traditional payment methods because that's the payment method people use today. Will that be the payment method people use you know, forever? You know, who knows, right? But for the next couple of years, people want to be paid in their bank account. So this is another dimension of what, what blockchain middleware provides for both retail and for uh, institutional payments. A as you can see, the goal here is that you have reliable inputs and you have a method of payment that makes your contract appealing to users. That, that's basically the, the main focus of what, of what a successful secure blockchain middleware would achieve. Now, oops. The, the, the goal for us is essentially the creation of building blocks that smart contract developers in various chains can use to build their contracts. We feel that once there's a multitude of inputs and outputs that can be built around core smart contract code, we will see uh, a massive increase in the amount of applications that are externally connected and therefore much more useful, right? So if, if you were to try to build something like Uber before you had a GPS API, before you had SMS APIs, and before you had payments APIs, the people building Uber, they would write their core Uber code, and then they would need to build three new businesses. They would need to build SMS, API, functionality, GPS, and payments capabilities. That's kind of the situation we have today in smart contract uh, land. Uh, I'm a good developer, I can write good core code, but when I try to get my contract doing something in the real world or affecting real world changes, I run into a wall. It, in, in, in our opinion, if we remove that wall by creating a multitude of inputs and outputs, kind of pre-made chain links that provide specific inputs into contracts, like in, in a way that a developer can show up and grab the code of the chain link, drop it into their contract, and they have a market price. Grab the code of the chain link, drop it into their contract, and they have shipping data, right? That's gonna allow people to build externally connected applications extremely quickly, and that's gonna get us to the place where at least we're very excited about being, which is many highly useful contracts that are doing uh, important things in the real world in a better way than traditional digital agreements, right? So the first approach, as, as we just chatted about, was decentralization and making sure the inputs are reliable on, on, uh, within, this, within the scope of the same logic as contracts themselves, which is just redundancy of a mechanism that you wanna make reliable. The next piece of our approach to make sure there, there's end-to-end -end reliability is basically the use of trusted execution environments. Trusted execution environments uh, made by companies like Intel, using Intel SGX, are specific they're basically specific pieces of hardware that have their own memory, they have their own processing power, and they function in a more secure manner than other computation environments. So what that means is if you do computation in a trusted execution environment, that computation is private and more secure. In, in our case, it's particularly useful because the people operating the chain link nodes, you could give them code to run. If they run this code in a trusted execution environment, even the person running the chain link node cannot know what they're running, right? You can give them encrypted code, whether it's smart contract code or code related to getting data or code related to doing anything out in the real world. They can receive that code, they can run it for you, but they can never know what that code is, they can never tamper with that code, and the only thing they could do is just turn off their chain link, at which point it would become immediately obvious that they're very bad operators and that you, you, know, you shouldn't use them and nobody would use them. So in order to understand a little better why trusted execution is another additional layer in our approach to security, I think it's useful to sort of understand a little more about what it does. 
What it really does is it creates a separate environment with its own processing and memory that traditional system resources can't inject a vulnerability into, basically. Basically, what it does is it, it, it shrinks the attack, um, the attack surface area from other applications, hypervisors, the OS, and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it shrinks it down between, between just the lowest level of the hardware and your very specific application, right? So it, it's an interesting approach that, that we're, we're, we're actively applying to make it so that chain link node operators, you know, you can have both decentralization and you can have nodes that are very secure. Once you give them encrypted code to run, once you give them operations to do, the, the operations will be done in a way that they themselves, the people running the software, couldn't even tamper with them. And so the middleware becomes increasingly secure and reliable. Now, the approach we have to doing this is something called Town Crier. Town Crier basically is the use of trusted execution environments for providing data to blockchains. Now, what Town Crier does is it receives requests from a user contract, and then it processes those requests within an enclave. So uh, this specific piece of hardware with its own memory and processing capabilities that's isolated from many other vulnerabilities is where the processing of the request by a contract for data actually happens. Then the trusted execution environment reaches out to the relevant data feeds, acquires that data, and returns it back to the contract. So basically, it's, it's very similar to what a traditional Oracle or, or a traditional chain link would do, except in this highly secure environment and it's a technology that's been built by, you know, in our opinion, some of the smartest people in, in cryptography and, uh, and, uh, and kind of the blockchain space as well uh, by, by folks at IC3 and Ari Jules and a lot of, lot of great, really, really, really bright people. So it, it's an approach that, that we're actively adopting to, to make sure that kind of oracles can function not only in a decentralized way, but also in a highly reliable trusted execution environment way. Now, the other things that trusted execution environments do is they turn oracles or chain links into good sources, uh, good, good resources for off-chain computation. Basically, because the chain link now runs a trusted execution environment, you can now do off-chain code execution that isn't just about data delivery. You can do off-chain code execution for cal calculations and, and any number of other events that people find important, but they can't do on chain. Maybe because they, they want to keep that code execution private. Maybe because the code execu execution is too costly or even not possible on chain. And if you, if you have an environment that is decentralized and also very private, but can do other types of code execution, that is an attractive environment. If that environment also has the data that your contract needs, that's even better. Like I'll, I'll give you one good example is, sometimes people want cryptocurrency prices very, very quickly, like they want low latency. But block times are 15 seconds, right? So what you can do is you can have a chain link, ping a bunch of data sources, and you can set a threshold calculation within the chain link that I'm getting this data at you know, the millisecond level. When it hits that threshold is when I'm gonna write some data into the chain. And that way you, you're not consistently writing data in the chain and paying fees, and you have a millisecond level uh, clarity on price data, which is what many people need for reliability for, for, for their contracts. So, so basically, trusted execution also expands the capabilities of a chain link beyond just data delivery to a desirable off-chain computation environment. One of the benefits is you know, very secure data delivery with some computation on top, other benefits are that smart contracts can now control private keys. So a trusted execution environment can hold private keys and then it can receive commands from a contract about signing certain transactions or signing multi-signatures on behalf of that contract. The other thing that it's also very attractive for is these trusted ex execution environments do have more uh, computational capabilities and they are much lower cost to run than traditional main chain computations. So if you wanted to split your contract into two parts and you wanted to say, I want this part to be on the main chain, I want it to be the main reference contract that everybody looks at and relies on, 
and I want this other, this other piece of the contract to be, which is much more scalable, much more costly. I want that to be running in this off-chain, you know, reliable environment. It's gonna cost you much, much less, and it'll be private, and it'll have, you know, other properties, like it'll have immediate access to data. So there's just a, a very real dynamic that we're seeing where people are taking their contracts and they're splitting them into two parts. They're saying this is the on-chain part of the contract. It's gonna run on the main chain for everybody to access and rely on and get data about. And then there's, here's the off-chain part of the contract that runs in these other environments where it processes data and it does more complex calculations that are either too complex or that I don't wanna make public or both. The other thing that's particularly useful, and here we have a good example, is that you can actually run other software within a trusted execution environment. So let's say you had a lottery contract, right? And you wanted to assure people that the randomness that your lottery contract uses is not tampered with, right? One way you could do that is you could use an oracle to talk to a ser service like random.org to get the data from the service about, random, about a random number it generates and then give it back to the contract. Another way you could do it, which you know, could be, is, is probably more secure, is there are standard libraries that have been used for decades to generate randomness. You take this piece of code and you put it into an Intel SGX enclave. That library, which has been used for decades to generate randomness is in, 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 in you know, probably millions of pieces of software by this point, generates the randomness fo for you and sends that randomness directly from the trusted execution environment. So there are in, in entire sets of computations and then you know, return, sends that into the, um, in this case, the EVM to broadcast it out to, to the relevant contract. So th there are actually entire sets of computations that you would usually use, that you could use a service for, or you would, uh, you, know, you would have problems, people would have trust problems with, like how do I know that your lottery contract is actually random? How do I know that you're not gaming the random, randomness in your lottery to benefit you, the lottery owner, or your friend, or whoever? This right now is basically the most solid approach to generating that randomness in a secure environment and providing that randomness in a secure manner to a lottery contract. And lottery contracts and gambling contracts right now in terms of mainnet traffic make up a lot of mainnet traffic. I don't know if that's gonna be the case in you know, however many months or years, but this is a, you know, a genuine thing that raises the security of those contracts in an immediate way because you now have an computational environment that's more reliable. And in our case, that computational environment is then replicated across multiple um, nodes to make a decentralized, what's called a decentralized oracle network. So these, I mean, this is really the, the two kind of fundamental approaches we have. We have the decentralized approach where you have however much redundancy you wanna purchase for assuring that an input is reliable. And then the decentralization you're purchasing is people running highly secure, highly reliable pieces of software that even they could not tamper with. And so this might mean that you might need to buy you know, only a certain amount of nodes, or if you buy many nodes, you know that they're running environments which are extremely reliable. What, what we really hope and what we're kind of really working towards is that this large degree of reliability from both a decentralization and a trusted execution environment perspective will allow us to create uh, a, a large collection of inputs. Basically what, what we're doing now is we're taking Chainlink and we're wrapping it around kind of many, many, many APIs. And we're basically making something that a developer could use in a minute or two. So instead of a developer going and learning an API and then figuring, figuring out a piece of middleware and then connecting to their contract, what's going to happen is they're gonna show up to a very large list of pretty much almost every resource they could want to connect their contract to. They're gonna take a small piece of code from the resource they want on that list. They're gonna drop it into their contract and they're gonna have that resource working in their contract without needing to learn the API of the resource, without needing to know anything about, you know, other than that, this is the resource I need and this is a reliable system and here are the, you know, for example, the reputation metrics of this uh, node operator who's delivering this resource to me. So, yeah, the, I mean, the goal for us is that we create this large collection of inputs and outputs that takes the smart contract space to connect to, to like another level of usefulness be, beyond just token movement, which is where we personally feel 
about 80 to 90 percent of the real uses and what will allow smart contracts as a whole to become the dominant form of digital agreement. Kind of that's what our company is really uh, trying to move the space towards. Am I good on time or questions? No questions. Questions? A couple minutes. Okay. I think I did that exactly the way I was supposed to, which is, which is good but rare. Um, so, yes, questions? So basically, the approach we have to the security of our code is we ha we're under M MIT license for the core code, and we basically have a very large security community and academic community doing peer review of our code. That's the code responsible for decentralization. The trusted execution environment is something built by companies like Intel. So our code uses an open source, like many eyes on the problem approach. Uh, so the problem that you define would be something that would be defined in, in improvement proposals and refined and looked at from, th from a security perspective. So basically people would do testing and figure out whether the, the functionality you're describing is a, is a relevant risk or it isn't, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad to answer offline about this specific point, if that helps. Yep. Sorry, could you speak louder? I'm sorry. No, 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 it's just an option. We have a defense in depth approach. So we, we allow people to purchase however much security of whatever type they want to purchase. If you just want to purchase a lot of decentralization, you can purchase that. If you want to purchase some decentralization and some Intel SGX security, you can purchase that. If you want to purchase decentralization and trusted environments and zero knowledge proof based security for scalability reasons, you can purchase all those. So we, yeah, we're, we're not myopically focused on, on any one technology or approach. We have what's called the defense in depth uh, approach to security. Well, you would use a library that generates randomness, and you would assume that that library is reliable because it's in this secure environment. You could do it that way if you want. You could have some, some method of doing it internally within the, the trusted execution environment. Basically, Trusted execution environments are relatively new technology, so that's why you don't probably haven't heard a ton about it. But it's it's one of an it's 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 one of many approaches that it's it's an approach we think is has a possibility of being successful in get, in providing certain guarantees. Any more? We're good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank <music> you.